And I hope you brought a Bible. Uh, I have a New Testament message from an Old Testament passage. I'd like for you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7. You know, this is the end of the year. Uh, this will be our last service this year. Next time we meet, it'll be 2014. Hard to believe, huh? Praise God. The time, it is passing us by. We're a little bit closer to the Lord's coming. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 7. And you know, I'm just going to begin reading in verse 1. The men of kerjath Jerem came and fetched up the ark of the Lord. This is the ark of the covenant. They brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. It came to pass while the ark abode in kerjath Jerem that the time was long for it was twenty years and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtoreth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth. You know, these are the foreign gods that they adopted. The Baals were the male deities, uh, usually very pornographic images of a male a bull or a man, half bull. The, and, and all of the ancient Canaanite uh, groups had Baals of their own, uh, some god of their own. But the Ashtaroth would have been the female goddess, and again, a pornographic image, oftentimes many, many breasted. These were fertility goddesses, uh, and many of the rites associated with ancient worship were uh, lewd, vile. They involved prostitution with temple prostitutes and so forth. So Samuel's message is you have to put away these gods and the attending immorality that goes along with them. And verse 4, they did. They put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mitzpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. Mitzpah. There were several places named Mitzpah in the, in the Scriptures. The word literally means the watchtower. It was a hill. They were, these were high places that had commanding views of the countryside. And so what Samuel is saying, get, get all Israel. Let's gather them all together. And verse 5, I will pray for you. I will pray for you unto the Lord. Don't ever, don't ever doubt the power of prayer or the power of one godly person who prays, male or female. And they gathered together to Mitzpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day. As Brother Joe said, that fasting gives wings to your prayers. And they said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mitzpah. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mitzpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard that they were afraid of the Philistines, here comes this mighty Philistine army attacking them immediately. The children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. Samuel, don't stop praying. We're going to go battle, but don't you stop praying. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering. This is a whole burnt offering unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered 
with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines. Now this is some supernatural divine intervention. And he discomfited them. Were these fiery hailstones? Were these, uh, were these rumblings? There was some judgment involved here that smote the Philistines. The Bible says they were smitten before Israel. And, when the, and then the men of Israel went out of Mitzpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under Bethkar. This was it for the Philistines. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mitzpah and Shin. Shin means the tooth. <laughs> so there was some mountain, some ridge that had a tooth-shaped object there. So between the watchtower and the tooth, he set up a stone. And notice this, he called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto has the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. We sang a song today, Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart, to hear thy grace, streams of mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. He goes on in the second stanza, says, Here I raise my Ebenezer. Now, you remember singing that? Yeah. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Did, did you scratch your head and wonder what it meant? Yeah. <laughs> I raise my Ebenezer. Only Ebenezer we think of is Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> From the Christmas carol, you know, that... Charles Dickens is the one, by the way, who made Christmas what it is today in America and England. But that's another story for another time. <laughs> Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I have come. God, you brought me to this place. And here we raise this. Ebenezer is a compound Hebrew word. It means a stone of help. A stone of help. Here I raise my Ebenezer, the stone of help. It was a reminder, a memorial, that it was God who brought us here. It was God who delivered us from the Philistines. It was God, it was God who did it. It was not our might, our strength that brought us out of this captivity. You know, they were 20 years captive by the Philistines, a vassal kingdom. And the Philistines were harsh people. Man, these were brutal people, cruel people. But this Ebenezer, this stone of help, in fact, some versions translate it stone of the helper. Stone of the helper. See, they got help. Where they were, they got there by divine help. They raised an Ebenezer, a stone of help, to remind them that I didn't get here on my own strength or by my own power or by my own intelligence. We didn't get to this place by any of our own personal industry. We got here by divine help. Amen. And this stone, now this had to be a big stone. This had to be something massive because it would stand from that time forward as a reminder that where they were, God brought them. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about memorials uh, when we were dealing with the subject of the communion. And the Lord said, you do this in remembrance of me. You do this as a memorial. You do this to remember me. Every time you do it, this is no mere empty rite or ritual. It's no magic thing, but it is a remembrance. Every time you do it, you remember me. You remember the price I paid for you. You remember what it cost me for you to be saved, for you to be in this place singing and worshiping and, and thanking God. Well, that's what a memorial is. A memorial reminds us of some significant event. Uh, they have memorials all over every city. You know, something significant happened in this place. Something that, that changed things. Something... Uh, to signify a very important event. Maybe some great sacrifice was made there. I grew up in, in Chalmette in the shadow, almost in the shadow 
of the uh, Chalmette Battlefield and the Chalmette Museum. And when I was a kid, we played all around that area, uh, digging and, and so forth. And, and several of us uncovered ancient cannonballs that we, we, uh, we actually contributed to the museum there. And I don't know if they're still there to this day. I haven't been there since Katrina, but... <laughs> Uh, but you know, that battlefield is a reminder of a terrific battle that took place right here in the United States of America. I don't know if you know it, but it was the most significant land battle that ever occurred on American soil against a foreign foe. That battle changed everything. You see, the British were once again pressing uh, to crush the young American nation. After, Louisi after the Louisiana Purchase, uh, that didn't settle too well with the British. And the war was called the War of 1812 ensued. And the, the great final battle, actually the battle that broke the back of the British, of the British attack, occurred right over there in Chalmette, Louisiana. There was a naval um, armada that came into Lake Bourne. In fact, 200 years ago this very month, 200 years ago this month, that naval battle occurred in Lake Bourne, uh, fighting a British armada that eventually sank or destroyed the American ships, captured them, sank them, destroyed them. But that fight in Lake Bourne held the British l uh, away long enough for old Andrew Jackson to prepare his defenses over here in, the, in Chalmette. And that battle was a significant event. It occurred January 8th, 1815. So we're coming up on the anniversary of it, 199 years. Very soon. That event right there changed everything. Because from that day forward, the British withdrew. That was the end of it. And America's sovereignty was affirmed and it grew to the nation that it is today. There's memorials there. There's a cemetery there. There's a museum there. If you have never had a chance to go and see it, you really should. Because many lives were sacrificed there to keep America uh, free. It, look, if those guys hadn't won, old Andy Jackson and that ragtag group that he put together, if they hadn't won, you and me would be drinking tea and crumpets. And... Uh, and speaking with a British accent to this day. There are events that changed everything. And memorials to those events are significant. And it's for us to remember that, that things happened on this site that changed it all. Uh, I, I fish it, it down in Shell Beach, Louisiana, and there is a memorial there. At the end of the road, when you in, you get to that memorial, you better not go any further because you're in you in the Mr. Go Ship Channel. But right on the edge, here's a memorial. It's a cross and a big plaque, and that plaque has 163 names on it of the people in Saint Bernard Parish who died on that August 29th of 2005 when Hurricane Katrina came through and changed everything. It changed everything. That. That plaque is there to this day, and every year, every year on the memorial of Katrina, on that day, the politicians are out there in force, and they read every name on that plaque. Right. It's a, you know, it's a rather solemn event, but it's to remember, remember this event changed everything. This stone, this stone that Samuel set up in this place, reminded them that everything changed right here. Everything changed. He called it Ebenezer. He wanted them not only to remember what happened, but he wanted them to remember that it was God who changed it. It was God who delivered us. It was God who freed us. It was God who broke the yoke that was upon our necks. It was God who gave us liberty and freedom and, and blessing. I want to talk a little bit today about this Ebenezer, raising Ebenezer, because we have to, really in a spiritual sense, we have to raise our own Ebenezer stone. 
But before you can really grasp the full impact of Ebenezer, there's another name we have to grasp. And that name occurs just a little bit over. We're going to back up to chapter 4. Because there's another name we'll see beginning there, the name of Ichabod. To fully understand Ebenezer, you have to also understand Ichabod. So these are two really important names for us to grasp this morning. First Samuel chapter 4. Y'all can hang with me a little bit, huh? The Ebenezer Stone. But you know like Paul Harvey used to say, you have to hear the rest of the story? Yeah. Well, this kind of introduces us to the rest of the story. Then you can appreciate Ebenezer. You see, this place where Samuel put up the stone that he called Ebenezer had a history. And beginning in 1 Samuel 4, you'll see that the history of this site was quite tragic. Beginning in verse 1, the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Samuel was a prophet and a mighty prophet, a man of God, who preached fearlessly and continually, preaching against the errors and sins and idolatries of his nation. Verse 1 says, Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. This is what it became called, and, and the whole region became known as that. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. And they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. Now this is a terrible defeat. Uh, for Israel at the hand of the Philistines. Uh, 4,000 of the Jewish soldiers were killed. Unfortunately, that wasn't the end of the story there. The battle went downhill from there. Because you read in the very next verse, verse 3, when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? We don't understand why we lost this terrible battle. Well, Maybe it should have dawned on them that because of their idolatries, they were adapt, adopting the idols and the idol worship from the surrounding Canaanites, that maybe God was no longer going to defend them as he did before. You know, you start adopting the ways of the world, and uh, you open the doors to your life, your heart, your marriage, your health, your business. You open up doors to demonic attack. There is a supernatural protection that comes automatically with serving the Lord. There is. Does it mean we don't go through battles, trials, and struggles? No, we still go through them, but the Lord is with us. He's for us. He's holding our hand and bringing us through the rivers and through the fires. He says, He don't say you're not going to go through the rivers. He said, they won't overwhelm you. He doesn't say you won't go through the fire. He said, they won't burn you. But when you abandon the Lord and you start adopting the ways of the world and the practices and habits and ungodliness of the world, you move yourself out from under God's umbrella. And now, you on your own. Israel found themselves on their own. They said, what are we going to do? We don't understand. So one of them had a brilliant idea. They said... Verse 3, let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it comes among us, it will save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts that dwells between the cherubim and the two sons of Eli. Now, Eli was a godly man. His sons were not. They were ungodly. They were vile, bankrupt morally and spiritually. They were corrupt. But the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark and the covenant of God. Now, they had this great idea. Let's go get the ark. The Philistines beat us, 
But we know if we bring the Ark of the Covenant with us into battle, nobody can stand. Because I guess they thought it was like a big giant rabbit's foot. You know, a good luck charm. Right. We bring this with us. It's like bringing horseshoes and rabbit's feet. and That's the stupidest superstition I ever heard of, a rabbit's foot. The rabbit was very unlucky. It didn't do him no good at all. Let's fetch the ark. I want to read something to you from the footnote in my, uh, my Bible. It says, The ark represented God's presence in Israel. The people thought the ark would unconditionally guarantee God's favor and power. They failed to understand that a symbol of spiritual things does not itself assure one of the reality to which it points. God remained with his people only as long as they sought to maintain their covenant relationship to him. Likewise, under the new covenant, submitting to water baptism or partaking of the Lord's Supper will be of no spiritual benefit unless one truly submits to the Lord and his righteous ways. So, that's uh, absolutely true. So they go get the Ark of the Covenant. It's a brilliant idea, they think. We're going to march it into battle with us. And uh, verse 6, when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, whoo, boy, when they brought that covenant into the camp, verse 5, all Israel shouted with a great shout. Man, they had some enthusiasm so that the earth rang again. They broke all the decibel, uh, you know, sound limits like they try to do in the Superdome. They broke all those decibel records. That was a great shout. The Philistines said, we don't have a chance now. We in bad trouble because they brought the ark into their camp. The Philistines were afraid. Verse 7, they said, God has come to their camp. They said, woe unto us, for there has not been such a thing here too. Woe to us, who's going to deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. It's not that Israel had many gods. Israel had, they were supposed to have one God. And that one God represented his presence in that ark. They said, we're in trouble now. All the momentum is against us. We don't have a chance. But look, some voice rose up in verse 9 and said, you be strong and act like men. Quit yourselves like men, the King James says. It means act like men. Don't start melting right here. The Philistines are encouraging themselves, you see. They put on some Joel Osteen tapes and got some real positive self thinking, you know, what, what we can go do if we just concentrate on it. You know, some of these principles work whether you employ the God of the Bible or not. There is power in positive thinking. I mean, you can rally yourself. You can. There's power, there's power in it that's totally uh, devoid of any good virtue. I won't say it's devoid of evil. Because maybe it is, there's something in it, you know, when we just tell ourselves how great we are yeah, yeah. and how great, how great we can do all in ourselves and on our own. But, but notice, it worked. Oh, you Philistines, don't you become servants to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Act like men and fight. Boy, you talk about a rally. So they did. So the Philistines fought, verse 10. And Israel was smitten. And they fled every man to his tent. And there was a very great slaughter. For there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. Now you think things were bad before. This is the spot where 4,000 had just died. Now 30,000 more died. Well, you know, it was partially because the Philistines rallied their forces, but I'll tell you what it was mostly because of, because God withdrew his protection. Amen. And he allowed this judgment to fall upon his people. Because they didn't turn to the Lord with their heart. They turned to the Lord with some superstitious talisman. They were going to bring in this big giant charm bracelet, you know, the, the Ark of the Covenant. 30,000 footmen died. But look, that's again still not where it ended. Verse 11, 
and the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. So the two ringleaders of it all, Hophni and Phinehas, were both killed along with the 30,000. And to make matters as bad as they could possibly be, the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines and carried off. It doesn't get any worse than that. It doesn't get worse than that. At least you wouldn't think. This is the spot, by the way, where 20 years later, Samuel would raise that stone, that Ebenezer stone. But for 20 years, Israel was subject once again to the Philistines. But look, the story still doesn't end there in verse 11. Because when news was heard of what happened, verse 15 says, Eli was 98 years old. His eyes were dim. He couldn't see. When the man says, I've come out of the army, I fled out of the army, he said, well, what happened? Verse 17, the messenger said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. There's been a great slaughter among the people. Your two sons are both dead, and the Ark of the Covenant has been captured. It came to pass when he made mention of the Ark of the Covenant, he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck broke and he died, for he was an old man and heavy. He had been a judge for 40 years in Israel. Well, this, that's still not the end of the story. Because not only did Eli die when he heard the news, but his daughter-in-law, this is Phineas's wife, Phineas, one of the ringleaders in this thing, his wife was with child, soon to be delivered when she heard the news that the ark was taken, that her husband was dead, her father-in-law was dead, she bowed herself and travailed for her pains came upon her. That is, her labor pains. And notice verse 20. She did deliver a son, but she died in childbirth. About the time of her death, the women that stood by her said, Unto her, fear not, you have borne a son, but she answered them not, neither did she regard it. She died. But before she died, she named her son. Yeah. Verse 21, she named the child Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory is gone. The glory is gone. She named her child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law, and because of her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Ichabod. No more glory. That's what it means. All the glory... That is, the presence, the power, the blessing, the very covenant itself, all represented in that Ark of the Covenant, was lost and gone and carried away by the Philistines. It was departed from Israel. Uh, all of that signified in the carrying away of the Ark, Israel is left barren, without God, without hope. I want to read something to you from Kyle and Delitz. These are... Uh, Jewish scholars, they, 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 uh, their expertise was in the Hebrew language. I want to read something to you that they said regarding this very passage. The repetition of these words. You see, twice she has said the glory is departed. Verse 21, verse 22. The repetition of these words shows how deeply the wife of the godless Phineas had taken to heart the carrying off of the ark, and how in her estimation the glory of Israel had departed with it. Israel could not be brought lower. It, could, it couldn't be any worse than this. It could not be brought lower. 30,000 died, soundly crushed and defeated by the Philistines. Phineas and Hophni killed. Eli, the judge, who had judged him for 40 years, dead. 
But the worst of all, the Ark of the Covenant captured and carried away into the, Philist the land of the Philistines. With the surrender of the earthly throne of his glory, the Lord appeared to have abolished his covenant of grace with Israel. For the ark, with the tables of the law, and the mercy seat, was the visible pledge of the covenant of grace that Jehovah had made with Israel. This was as bad a defeat as it could be. In fact, it couldn't be worse than this. A hopeless defeat. Rejection. They felt the total dejection and despair, uh, refusal by God. Ichabod, Ichabod, the glory has departed. But once again, this isn't the end of the story. The Philistines took this ark and uh, they carried it around like they had just won the Lombardi trophy. You know, it was a... Uh, they were marching it around from city to city, and they finally decided they would put it into the temple of their god, Dagon. Dagon, the fish god. You read chapter 5, it's a very interesting account. Verse 1, they took the ark, and they brought it from Ebenezer. They brought it to Ashdod, and they took the ark. They brought it into the house of Dagon. They set it by Dagon. They put it at the foot of the, the big old idol of their Canaanite deity. They, you know, like the like God of Israel, the God of Israel is servant. He's at the feet of Dagon, the great Dagon. Of course, the Bible says they went in the next morning, verse 3, and Dagon was on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord, as though Dagon had fallen in total homage before the ark of God. And so you can imagine they scratching their heads saying, how did this happen? So they took him and set him in his place again. They put him back up on his pedestal, you know. But the next morning, verse 4, he was on his face before, on the ground before the ark of the Lord again. But this time his head was broken off and both of the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump was left. Now they're scared. And verse 6 says, The hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them. He smote them with emeralds. This is kind of a strong word here. He smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coast. I mean, this is a plague that smote them. The word emeralds in the Hebrew is a little interesting. It means tumors or mounds. Some versions translated hemorrhoids. Other versions translated a bloody flux. Some translated tumors. Some translated as the plague, like the bubonic plague. Some hor horrible disease came upon them and they were dying left and right. Whatever this was, it was gruesome, painful, and deadly. When the men of Ashdod saw what was going on, they said, you know what, we think we, think we need to get this ark of, of, uh, of God out of here. Let's get it out of here. Because we think that this is all because of that. So they got all the Philistines together, verse 8. They said, what are we going to do with it? They said, I know, let's take it to another city. Yeah, that's a good idea. So they carried it there. But look, verse 9, once they brought it to this other city, the same thing that happened to them happened to that city. So he smote the men of that city, verse 9, both small and great, and they had emrods in all their secret parts. Now this can't be good. So they said, we want it out of here. I know, let's send it to another city. Because surely this is coincidental. So they took it to Ekron. It came to pass, as it came to Ekron, the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought the ark to us to slay us. So then they said, we got to have another idea. Because every place this ark goes, people start dying. It's a terrible plague spreads among them. There was, look, verse 11. 
There was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men that died not were smitten with the Imrods. And the cry of the city went up to heaven. Look, this is a terrible, terrible vexation. Terrible, horrible affliction, sickness, and so forth. Seven months they kept the Ark of the Covenant. And for seven months people were smitten with plagues and, and terrors and they died. They finally said, we got to get rid of the ark. Let's send it back to Israel. So then they decided they would send it back with a gift because they were afraid not to. So they made golden imrods, whatever that is. I don't want to imagine it, what it is. But it was a gift to give back. And they made golden mice. Well, there's a passage that says that mice had uh, like a plague just overrun the place. So apparently uh, this was another part of the plague that, uh, that was going on over here. But So they put it on a new cart because they thought it might be profane to use a cart that had been used before. Uh, so they put it on a new cart and they took a couple of milk cows you can read the rest of this uh, beginning around verse 10. They took milk cows and let me tell you what their thought was. Here's their thinking. Maybe all of this really is a coincidence. The fact that everywhere the ark went, our people got sick, got plagued, you know, because people never want to associate God uh, maybe smiting us or maybe it's God blessing us. They want to take credit if it's a blessing. They want to. You're right. So they said, this is what we'll do. We'll send this ark on a new cart. We'll put milk cows pulling it. Now, a milk cow is not used to pulling anything. Because that's what they, they're milk cows. But we're going to tether it to this cart. And we're going to send it on the road to Israel. And, and we're going to make sure that these milk cows have young calves that we're going to put back in the stall. Because all the instinct of this milk cow is going to be to turn around and go back to my calf. All their instinct is not going to be to travel down this road further and further away from my calves. They wanted to, they want, because this is what their thinking was. You, you read chapter 6, it's a fascinating passage. They say, if this cart, if these cows carry it all the way into Israel, we will know that it was the hand of God that was heavy upon us. And that's exactly what happened. Those milk cows looked straight down the road, they didn't think about their calves. Even though they had never pulled a cart before, these are not yoke animals. But they pulled that yoke, they pulled that cart, and they carried it right across the border into Israel. And as you read in chapter 6, you've got people, verse 13, for instance, Beth Shemesh. Now, this is across the border. They're in Israel now. They're out there reaping their wheat harvest. And they lifted up their eyes, and they saw the ark. They rejoiced to see it. And here's a cart coming. A cart behind it. Uh, nobody's driving this cart, by the way. You know, they just sent these animals down the road. Nobody's driving it. And uh, here comes the ark of the covenant coming back to us, pulled by milk cows. <laughs> and, and they rejoiced. They took the, the ark off of the cart. They burned the cart. Uh, 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 made it an altar and burned it, slaughtered the, cat, the cows for an offering, and uh, they rejoiced. Praise God, the ark is back. They were some happy that day. But that's not the end of the story either. Because then some of them, they decided that they would peek inside that ark of the covenant. Some, some of the, the Jews there. And... Uh, you know, that's taboo. Yep. You're not supposed to do that. So that's what they did. A bunch of them peeked inside, treating it like it's, you know, something profane, very casual, not, not giving it the awe, the honor, the reverence that they should. Verse 19 says, He smote the men of Beth Shemesh. Because they had looked into the ark of the Lord, even he smote of the people fifty thousand and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because the ark had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. Now this passage 
is a little bit difficult in the Hebrew because the numbering is ambiguous in this particular place. Uh, the King James, when you read this passage, it, it would make you think that 50,000 and, and three score and ten, so 50,000 and 70 people died of Beth Shemesh. But that's not the way the rabbis, the ancient rabbis, translated it. They translated it that out of the city of 50,000, 70 died. Uh, who had looked into the ark. Seventy who looked into the ark died. Josephus actually records this account in his secular history of, uh, of Judaism and said that 70 men were struck by lightning for looking into the ark, that that's what happened to them. There is another alternative that some have proposed that seems the most likely to me, and that being that 50,000 in seven months had died from the ark amongst the Philistines. You, you, you want to remember, it's been carried around for seven months in all these cities and people were dying everywhere. That 50,000 of the Philistines died and then when it was brought into Beth Shemesh, 70 men profaned uh, themselves or profaned it by looking into it and 70 died there. And so all total, you've got 50,000 and 70 who died. But what we do want to see is that the grief was great and the grief was real and they sent for the Levites and they said, please, come get this ark. Come, come move it. Uh, and they did. Verse 20, uh, verse 21, they came, they fetched it. Chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, the men of Kijaf, uh, Kerjath, Jerem, they fetched the ark of the Lord. They brought it to the house of Abinadab in the hill. They sanctified Eliezer to keep it. He's not going to be serving it, touching everything, just protect it. And it came to pass while the earth, while the ark abode there, that the time was long for twenty years it stayed in that place. Maybe out of fear, maybe out of reverence. Uh, Samuel was a young prophet at the time. Twenty years it stayed right there. And for twenty years, Israel remained under Philistine oppression, bondage, and servitude. Twenty years. But then, but then, the winds of revival started to blow. Again, under the preaching of Samuel, the prophet, now Samuel was fearless, and Samuel was bold, and Samuel told it like it was. Now, you know, this has spiritual application to each of us, and I would like for you to think about that, that while it's a tremendous story, uh, a tremendous account of what happened to Israel, let's consider the spiritual implications along the way. Because there are people all over who are in bondage to all, of all kinds, yep. oppressed uh, with all kinds of oppression discouraged, despairing, defeated, forlorn, uh, feeling hopeless. I mean, let's face it, that's the kind of world we live in. You're right. But you know, Samuel had the right message because he told them in verse 3, notice verse 3, Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel. Now this is an, he's an itinerant preacher, you know. He travels around, he preaches, and to everybody he preaches to, he says, if you do return to the Lord with all your hearts. I put a circle around if. In fact, you might even want to put a circle around you. If you return. If you return to the Lord, and notice, with all your heart. Not half-hearted. Not, well, you know, I might try it. It's like trying a new brand of detergent. I'll see if I like it. You know, if not, I'll go back to serving the devil or whatever. But if you return to the Lord with all of your heart, and notice, he's demanding repentance here. And repentance is more than the way some people define it. Some people define repentance as a change of mind. You change your mind. Well, it does mean that. It does mean a change of mind. But that's not all it means. 
Today there is a message that I have heard preached that's causing me great alarm because this message is becoming more and more popular. That repentance is merely a change of mind. No, it's more than a change of mind. It's a change of direction. Amen. If you're driving your car, and uh, you know some men don't like to read maps and things like that, and, and they're just driving and they're going in the wrong direction, and the wife is saying, you passed the exit. You passed the exit. You passed the exit. And he says, well, you know, I cha you've changed my mind. But you're still driving in the wrong direction. You have to turn around. Well, that's what repentance is. Oh, yeah, I'm going the wrong way. And it means you turn around and start going the right way. He says you put away the strange gods. Put away the Ashtaroth, these Canaanite goddesses. You know, I could hammer here that the message of the prophets was always against idolatry. You don't bring the idolatry of the heathen into the people of God or into the worship of God. But I'm not preaching that today. He says, you put away the strange gods from among you and prepare your hearts. Prepare your hearts unto the Lord. Amen. Prepare your hearts unto the Lord. Amen. Well, he says, and you serve him only. That is, you know, exclusively. When you prepare, by the way, the word here means to establish, to settle. Uh, it means to be steadfast. So what he's, what he's requiring is not a little temporary change of direction and then you turn back to the backsliding ways you were going before. It's not a momentary turn, but a real, total, settled, fixed, steadfast turning to the Lord with all of your heart. He's talking about commitment here. And then you serve him partially. No, he says you serve him only. And notice the promise, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. This is strong preaching of repentance. That's what he's preaching right here. Yeah. Turn to God with all your heart. Turn away from the idols. Destroy the idols. Get rid of them. Don't just pack them away or see how much you can sell them for. <clears throat> Get rid of them. <clears throat> and look, you know God's moving because verse 4, they did it. They listened. Sometimes you got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. Sometimes you got to get tired of being oppressed, beat down, right. beat up. They did it. They put away the Balaam, they put away the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. They turned to the Lord with all their hearts. And so Samuel says, now gather the people together, and I will pray. And when Samuel prays, things happened. Verse 6, they gathered together. Notice... They went to this watchtower, Mitzpah, the high place, somewhere with a, a big view of the surrounding area. They poured out water before the Lord. The idea here is this is a sign of our tears, of our humiliation, a sign of our sorrow, uh, that we are broken, our hearts are broken. Uh, their, their hearts are broken, of course, because, because of their sins. Notice also the Bible says, verse 6, they fasted that day. This too is a sign of humiliation and repentance and, and, uh, and, and prayer. They fasted that day. Notice they confessed their sins. We have sinned against the Lord. We have sinned. There is a frank confession of sin. They're not hiding their sins anymore. They're not excusing their sins. We have sinned. And Samuel judged the people. The word judge here is not what you think. It's not a judge sitting on a, you know, a bench with a gavel. The idea is he governed the people. He commanded the people. The idea here is that they submitted to Samuel. They submitted to him, to his leadership, to his message, because they knew he was telling them the truth. And they said, Samuel, you're right. You, you are right. We're going to submit to the Lord. We're going to listen to everything you've got to say. Of course, the Philistines saw this great gathering of Israel, and they consider it a revolt. So they attacked. 
And Israel told Samuel, you pray, verse 8, we'll fight and we'll trust the Lord to save us. And Samuel made an offering and God heard and you know the rest of the story. You've read the rest of the story. Which brings us back to verse 12. The Lord heard Samuel's prayer. Israel soundly defeated the Philistines because God smote them. And then they pursued them and did the rest of the smiting. And in verse 12, Samuel set a stone, a monument, a memorial stone to commemorate their victory. He called it Ebenezer, the stone of help. The Septuagint, the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew, tra tra does translate it the stone of the helper. Once they were defeated, now they were victorious. This marked the spot where everything changed. This marked the spot. Just like that memorial down there in Chalmette marks the spot where everything changed for a young nation. Or that memorial out there at the end of the ship channel marks a spot where so many things changed because of uh, that terrible hurricane. This, verse 12, raising this Ebenezer stone marked the spot where everything changed. This is where Israel's heart changed. Their heart changed towards the Lord. They were going to serve Him now with all their heart. They changed from rebellion to surrender. Hello. This is where they reversed course. They went from backsliding and stubbornness and idolatry back to true worship, back to serving the Lord with all of their heart, to surrender to God, to consecration to God. Because that's what this symbolized. Here, we consecrated our lives to God. Here, we made a commitment. Here we fixed our heart to serve the Lord. No more playing with the world, no more playing with the idolatry around us. Here we fix our hearts to serve God and Him only. Notice what he said, to Him only. So they went from denying sin to confessing their sin. They went to complete and absolute faith and surrender in the Lord. And, and as a result, they also went from defeat to victory. They went from failure to success and went from despair to joy. Because here at Ebenezer is where everything changed. And if ever they were tempted to go back, that stone would remind them of where God brought them. What he brought them from. Defeat, failure, oppression, despair. That stone reminded them God has forgiven you. God has delivered you. God has blessed you. God has brought you this far. And the implication in it all, verse 12, he said, Hitherto has the Lord helped us. The implication in it all is that God will continue to help you as long as you serve Him and follow Him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, you keep on the right direction, the Lord's going to always bless you. He will always be with you. Here we are. We're at the close of another year. We're, we're looking ahead to a brand new year. And with brand new year... Who knows what's ahead? This what we do. This is what we do know. That if we will fix our hearts to serve the Lord and Him only, Amen. if we will consecrate ourselves afresh, as Israel was called to do, if we will put away the sins that beset us, if notice chapter seven verse three, if you. If you, if you will, then he says, then he will, verse 3, he will deliver you. If you will, if you will. So we have a responsibility here to put behind us all the things that cause us trouble, vexation, all the compromises, the worldliness, the sins, the habits, whatever it is, the wrong way of thinking, the wrong way of talking, the bad attitudes, if you will, if you will put these things behind you, then the defeats that we have experienced in the past, God will put that behind us. And let us experience new victories, new conquests in our life, new pinnacles of spiritual heights, 
new blessings. Look, we can all look back over the course of this past year. We've all been through some trials and troubles. There are things the Lord has brought us through. But we can all say, like Israel did, hitherto, to this place, the Lord has brought us. He's brought us through. Here we are. Here we are. And if we will trust Him, He'll bring us all the way. He'll bring us safely to uh, that other shore. Christianity has several memorial events that are fixed. That is, water baptism is a memorial. Uh, the Lord's Supper is a memorial. But you know, the great memorial that you and I have to have is the one where we turn away from this past and we turn to the Lord with all of our hearts. No more playing with sin. No more playing with worldliness. Here's a brand new year. It's a perfect time to, to raise your Ebenezer. Amen. Say, Lord, you've brought me to this place, this place of understanding. I understand. This place of faith, Lord Jesus, I believe. And this place of, sin, of awareness of our sin so that we can confess, Lord, I, I repent. I repent for all my failures, not only today and yesterday, but throughout the past year, throughout my life. I repent of these failures, Amen. these shortcomings, these, the way that I've spoken to some people, yeah. the attitudes that I've had towards others. Yeah. Lord, Lord, I repent of these things. I confess these things as sin. My attitude, my negativity, my short temper, my... These habits I keep falling back into. Oh, God, I confess these things as sin. And, Lord, I raise this Ebenezer of faith, Lord. I'm going to look to you, Lord, to follow you, to walk with you, to trust you. To, you brought me this far, and I know, Lord, it wasn't to forsake me here. Amen. If you will, this is what he says, if you will, then I will. You, you repent, I'll carry what a difference between the God of Israel and the God of the heathen. The God of the heathen, they have to be carried. But our God, He carries us. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Father, we do pray today. We do pray, Lord, and we pray with great thankfulness, Lord, that You have brought us to this place in our lives. And we're also thankful, Lord, that you're not going to leave us here, but that you're going to bring us onward and upward, closer to you, and, and to make us more like you. Lord, we do thank you that you are the forgiving God that heareth prayer, that you wash and cleanse and forgive and forget, that you don't hold against us our past mistakes, our errors, our sins, our failures, but you wash us clean, you make us new. And Lord, we thank you that you promise to be with us, to bless us, to provide for us, to protect us, to save us, to even save our loved ones as we trust you. Help us, Lord, one and all, to trust you. To trust you more as we raise our own Ebenezer, Lord, and we commit ourselves afresh to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Amen. So now...